The Canoe Show is brought to you in association with British Canoeing. Hello and welcome to The Canoe Show, the show that lifts the lid on the world of paddle sport. In this edition of The Canoe Show, we've got expert tips on taking great canoeing photographs, a profile of one of the world's greatest canoe races, and our canoe trail is the iconic Portsmouth Harbour. But first, we have a little teaser for you. Have a look at this clip and see if you could guess what happens next. Then at the end of the show, you can see if you were right. If you like canoeing and enjoy camping, what could be better than combining them both to make a mini adventure? I'm in Bedford to meet Rich Harpham, an expedition canoeist who runs canoe tours to his own wild campsite on the beautiful Great Ouse. So Rich, why go canoe camping? Well, everyone loves the great outdoors and this is a chance to connect with nature. Literally get the canoe and put your kit into it. We're gonna go down, get onto the river, paddle down on this canoe trail and paddle into the campsite. It's as simple as that. we were approaching Bedford itself and once in the town the riverside area was really nice with a tree-lined paved bank, two very distinctive bridges and a large park on the right. We portaged near the second bridge to drop down onto the lower stretches of the river. Once back on the water the river reverted to its more natural state and as we progressed it narrowed bringing us to the tributary that led to the campsite. This was really just a narrow stream, barely wider than the canoe, and in places very shallow. But soon enough we were there and could begin to make camp. After retrieving supplies from the boat, Rich picked a spot for the tent so we could get dry and I could change out of my wet paddling kit. Then came my next test, pitching the tent. Talk me through the procedure and what was the most important thing to do when you first turn up at your camp? Well, I think almost you can work from a, as I land, what do I need to do? So the first thing is to make sure my boat's tied up. And then as we come into a campsite, we want to see where's the best place to pitch, um, where it looks good for us. There's no dead wood falling over it. I've got shelter or not shelter, whatever I'm wanting. We're really lucky here. We can set up and we can use uh, open fires, uh, but in some areas you can't. Um, so again, is there an, is an area where you can and are we going to leave no trace? Are we going to perhaps dig out the turf, put the fire in there and then recover it so we don't leave a mess for other people? Um, and then of course shelter. We want shelter. We want to make sure before we get into our warm clothes that are dry that we're not going to get wet again. So maybe we need the tarp, maybe we need the tent up, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Then get changed. Then of course food, drink. It's not something that someone could just rock up and do anywhere though, right? I mean, there are parts of Britain, but I think it's about knowing where you are uh, in Scotland. Definitely you can wild camp, but also you've got to respect the place that you're at. So first of all, is there permission? And, um, and, and another thing is about leaving no trace. So whatever we bring in, we need to take out. And that's something that I've learned a lot uh, in places like Alaska, where you've got world heritage sites. You don't leave anything there. Um, you know, take any photos. 
So I'm warm and cosy now, Rich, but I can't help noticing we've only pitched one tent. Where are you sleeping? Don't worry, I've got my hammock. Well, I'm bushed. Night, night. I slept a lot better than I thought I would. Leaving Matchstick Wood, I really felt like I'd been on a proper expedition. And now I'm itching to go on another canoe camping trip. There are lots of providers out there and some stunning routes. So why not make a plan for your own mini adventure? There comes a point in everyone's life when there's a particular itch that's just got to be scratched. And if you're a flatwater canoeist, it's highly likely that that scratch is going to involve the Devizes to Westminster canoe race. The Devizes to Westminster canoe race or DW as it's widely called, dates all the way back to 1948 in one shape or another, and was born out of various informal canoeing challenges that ran down the River Avon to Christchurch in Dorset. The race runs from Devizes in Wiltshire for 125 miles to Westminster in London. The route follows the Kennet and Maven Canal until it reaches Reading, where it joins the Thames and then follows the path of this great river all the way to Westminster. There are two overall race categories. The four-day race, which is a stage race, and the non-stop race, which is the more famous of the two and the one we'll focus on here. The DW is a time trial, with crews starting at intervals. But the most interesting feature is that their start time is entirely determined by the time they've calculated it'll take them to reach Teddington in Surrey, not Westminster. That's because this is where the Thames becomes tidal and there's only a relatively small window of opportunity to catch the high tide and get down to Westminster. If they arrive too early, they're held at the lock until high tide, increasing their overall race time. If they arrive too late and miss the tide window, they're held at the lock until the next high tide, some 12 hours later. Most non-elite crews will aim to reach Westminster in under 24 hours, but some will be happy to finish in under 30. The course record is worthy of any sporting legend and was set in 1979 by Brian Greenham and Tim Cornish. It lies at an amazing 15 hours and 34 minutes. But you know, for me, the best thing about this race is that for the majority of the people taking part, it's not about the time. It's not even about where they finish on the result sheet. It's all about the journey. And let's face it, if you're going to spend 24 hours with someone in what is, after all, a very small boat, you might as well make the best of it. Every crew has a support team who are critical to their success. Paddlers need to take on food and drink regularly and as the race progresses, they need moral support and even firm direction to continue as fatigue starts to play games with their focus or judgement. Stop, stop. Along the route, crews have to negotiate over 77 locks, portaging around them and sometimes having to run quite long distances when there are two or more locks in very close succession this becomes an increasingly draining and dangerous factor further into the race, especially during the night, when the support teams play a vital role in keeping their paddlers safe. So if you like the sound of it, and you're up for a challenge, then all of us at the Canoe Show say good on you. But just remember one thing. This is the race that got the better of Steve Redgrave. Polo is a really dynamic sport. It's fast moving, full of drama, and to the uninitiated, looks pretty scary. Matches could take place indoors in a swimming pool or outside on a lake or dock. It's a straightforward setup. There are two opposing teams, and the objective is to get the ball into your opponent's net. 
But because kayaks are involved, it's a little more tricky to get around the field of play than in water polo. You have to propel and control your boat with your paddles, but you need to pass the ball and shoot for goal with your hands. The potential for collision is great, and it's also a contact sport, so you can actively try to destabilise an opponent to get possession of the ball. I'm here in London with Clapham Canoe Club to have a go for myself. So Paddy, tell me how it works. It's a team game, very much a team game. It's really good for improving your kayaking skills. Uh, it's five a side. You have a goal which hangs at either end and uh, the idea is to score more goals than the opposition. Well, I can't put it off any longer. I think it's about time I had a match. World Championships is coming to Britain and I'd really recommend getting along to see it because at top level this is one of the most exciting games you can see. I'm Anthony Edmonds, I'm a freelance photographer and I was the official photographer for British Canoeing at the London Olympics. OK, a few tips for taking good photos. First thing, know your camera. Learn uh, where the presets are and uh, make sure you can uh, get to them quickly. So let's say we're going to take a shot of um, somebody in a canoe, somebody on the river with you. We're going to take a portrait shot. So what you want to think about with portraits is can I see the person? Are they coming towards me? It's always good to see somebody's face. And if you can, focus on the eyes because that's the most important part. That's the bit that makes the image quite often. Where's the light? If the light's behind them, well, it could be a good silhouette shot, but you want the, the light usually uh, behind you. So we have the light on the face. We can get, we're going to get a, a great shot. One good tip on taking portraits. You often see uh, a portrait and the face is right in the middle of the picture. Try this, try putting the face to one side and then leaving the other half of the frame to give you some context. Now of course uh, canoeing is a great way to get close to uh, wildlife, but one tip if you are approaching wildlife, maybe the bird feeding at the side of the river, uh, don't go head on to it because it will probably see you coming and you'll scare it off. Actually I find if you zigzag towards it, amazingly it will probably ignore you, you'll get much closer and you'll get some really great images. When taking photos of uh, landscapes, think about where the horizon is going to go. Uh, often you see a horizon bang in the middle of the picture. That's not a very interesting shot, but you might want to make more of the cloud formations or on the great reflections that you're going to get from the lake. To do that, move the horizon up, use more of the reflection, move the horizon down, maybe to see more of the cloud formation, and you'll get some really great shots. All right, so the next shot to think about might be action shots. So the first thing is, if you've got a preset on your camera, then select that. If you don't have a preset, then get a nice fast shutter speed so we can get a really good shot. If you can, start focusing as soon as possible. If you can, again, uh, lock onto the head because when we take the shot, it doesn't matter if uh, other parts of the body, arms and legs are out of focus, but we really want to get that uh, head in focus. Next tip is actually taking the photo. I see a lot of people there pick up their compact camera, put it in front of them and uh, take the photo. Much better if you can to use two hands, keep a nice firm grip on the camera. And as you're taking the photo, don't stab the camera because doing that will move it. Just firm but gentle uh, squeezes. 
And my final tip is that uh, practice makes perfect. So get out there and take lots of photos. And one challenge, and that is every time you go out, try to learn a little bit more about the camera. Maybe you're a beginner, maybe all you know about are the presets, but now maybe you want to do a little bit more, you want to advance things, start to use the aperture, the shutter, etc. Just learn one thing each time you go out and you'll find that you start to master the camera. I'm starting out from Porchester Castle at the top of Portsmouth Harbour and paddling down to the harbour mouth where it meets the Solent. This is a tidal trail, so start and finish times are important and making sure you allow enough time to get back to the landing point is critical. Porchester Castle is a magnificent structure and a great focal point to start from and head back to. Paddling out, you can clearly see your main objective, the Spinnaker Tower, and Portsmouth's waterside retail attraction, Gunwharf Quays. You can also see the presence the Navy has, with warships and other naval vessels moored in the main dock area. The route is a very straightforward out and back trail, and you head straight across from Porchester to the Gosport side of Portsmouth Harbour to stay safe in the main boating channel. Once up in the shadow of the Spinnaker Tower, you can see the historic dockyard, and also the old defensive walls, made famous in TV newsreels whenever task forces set sail or return from conflict. Paddle on a bit further and you break out into the Solent itself, and if you're lucky, you'll see the hovercraft heading over to ride. The turnaround point lies back within the harbour itself, up Hasler Creek. The creek breaks out into an open body of water, where you can land on a public slipway to stretch your legs or have a bite to eat. The best part about it though, is that you pass the submarine museum on the way, with a decommissioned sub on a plinth overhanging the water's edge. It really is an impressive sight, and a great reward for the fairly long paddle up from Porchester. Heading back to the castle, I couldn't resist dipping into a small inlet to have a look around, and also stumbled across a small island, home to a variety of seabirds. Sadly no seals on this trip, but there's always next time. This is a great route, with plenty of interest, that's suitable for almost all abilities, provided you're comfortable in open water and travel in a pair or group if you're less experienced. It's best paddled in a touring boat, as you'll need to make good progress to stay within the tide window. But as long as you know the tide times, stick to the boating lanes and plan your trip to make sure you return before the tide starts running out fast, you'll have a great time. At the beginning of the show, we asked you to guess what happened next in this clip. So let's see if you were right. Well, that's it for another canoe show. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. The Canoe Show is brought to you in association with British Canoeing.